so many times um, I see people and I see them with such a God design upon their life. They have, they have such a God design on their life. They have such a, uh, many of them have a calling. They're called by God. Uh, many of them were called by God when they were just children. The hand of God was, was upon their lives. And uh, the hand of God is still upon their lives. But I've seen so many uh, people, especially God's people, come up short. And they, they're not attaining what it is that, that they've been called to do and what they've been designed to do by God. And they get trapped into a, um, a place in their mind and a place in their thinking, a place in their life, that it's almost just like a circle. So most of their whole life's just going around a circle. And it's, it's such a circle that it seems just to hold, hold people back. It just holds them in one spot. They were at the same place last year. They were at the same place the year before. It may be a generational thing. It may be something that... Uh, uh, I've seen it over and over again. I've seen families. If, if a family battles, uh, let's just say, depression, and just say that depression was on the mom or on the dad, or maybe on both of them, in many cases that same spirit tries to attach itself to the children. Generational things. I've seen households on, in many cases, many cases, drug addictions, alcoholism, prostitution, um, arrogance. Let me tell you something. So, there's one thing that will stop people more than anything than getting the favor of God is arrogance. Pride. Pride. And I've seen these generational things happen in what has been on the father or the uncle or the aunt or the mom, or a grandparent, or someone in the family, the same spirit attaches itself to the, to the descendants. I've got Bible for this. This is not just being blurted out of my mouth. I've got a lot of Bible for it. I may be able to speak some of it today. I don't know, but you trust me. Generational uh, blessings and generational curses, they both can travel. Do you hear me? I want to be on the side of the coin that says, I'm of the generation that passes on the blessing of God. The blessing. I want to pass on the blessing. Not the curse. I, I don't want to engender in my children that it's all right. I had, a, I had a man say one time, he said, you know what, I've told my son, he's just 13 years old, and I, I instructed him. He's, I instructed him to go out and and try out uh, young women, and uh, because I tried to give him a biblical principle that when he gets married, he's he's married. And I'm going, sir, you don't have no idea what you're really talking about. You can't tell your son to go out and try out women and see what kind of woman he likes, and try out women before he actually finds the woman, the person that is designed to marry, to be married to. God designed man for one woman. And I said, you've just, uh, you just, you just signed a death sentence upon your son. That's what I told him. I said, you just signed a death sentence for your son, spiritually speaking. By the time that boy was 20 years old, he died. You said, you spoke that only preacher? No, his dad did. I want to know, what are we engendering in our children and in our children's children? Are you teaching them the principles of God? Are you talking to them about Jesus? Because if you're not, somebody else is going to come along and start talking to them, and it may not be about Jesus. It may not be. 
And so we've got really a responsibility on us. I, I was praying the other day, and I'm going to share this with you. I want us to cast some vision here, if I can, to this congregation. I, we've got, what, 25, 30 people here today, and we need your help. We need your help. You've seen my wife up here just a moment ago. She was in tears. She's broken. She's hurting. I will not explain to you everything that happens in a pastor's life as it pertains to the pew. It's not, you couldn't handle it, man. <laughs> you just couldn't handle it. And, um, but I really ask you to pray for, for Sister Pastor. I really do, and I ask you to pray for us uh, more than you ever have before. Since the Lord has revealed to me uh, something to do that gives us some um, direction for the church, all hells broke loose. God warned it to me. He, he warned me before he gave me this revelation. And I want to say this before I give you this. I believe with all of my heart, and this is what I believe, and I believe it to be biblical. I believe it with all of my heart. That the people of God should have revelation of the Father on a continual basis. We, we should be getting downloaded to us from heaven revelations of the Father's heart and revelations of who He is, what He's about, what He wants and what He desires uh, on a regular basis. I was crying out yesterday right here and I said, God, I hadn't heard from you for a few days. And I don't know about you, some people might be able to go weeks, months, years and not hear from God. And it don't bother them. But friend, I want to tell you something. It bothers me if I don't hear from God every week. I'd like to hear from Him every day. Are you some kind of spiritual guru, preacher? No, no. I just try to stay in tune with the Lord. I try to stay in touch with the Lord that I might hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. How many believe God's speaking today? Amen. He's talking. He's speaking today. And uh, <clears throat> I want to hear what it is He has to say. And I want to say this to you. Uh, we have a great group of people. Uh, we have Marcos and Bree that are helping with the youth now. I'm so thankful for them doing such a good job. Doing a fantastic job ministering to the young people. Miss um, Sharon has been heading up uh, Christian education for quite some time. She's doing a fantastic job. She needs help. We, we need help in this church. We need, we need laborers to come forth and begin to pull in with what the, the vision of this church is and what we're about. Um, I can carry the load. I can carry uh, the load. I, I can carry heavy load. I really can. Um, I carry a lot of things, you know, and I can just keep them hush up before the Lord. And I've watched God through the years do things that I know that I couldn't have done, but He done them. And He worked some things out. But I'm asking you to help us with this endeavor on prayer. Wednesday nights, um, this, this past Wednesday night actually was so powerful. It really was. We had uh, just a small group of people here in the congregation. I read this vision of what God gave me on the way to church Wednesday night. He gave me this vision. Brandon Brummett had come and he had come in the office to talk to me and I didn't have the heart to tell him just to go away. I couldn't talk to him. So I'm writing this vision out. The Spirit of God's downloading this in me while I'm listening to Brother Brummett. You know, he wasn't bothering me. He wasn't interrupting. It was just like, when God's saying something, man, it's just like... And then you look at it and say, my God, did I write that? You, you been there? Did I write that? I can't even believe I wrote that. <clears throat> but Wednesday night, I read this to the congregation on Wednesday night. You know, we're going to start prayer meeting 
God hadn't given me the exact date yet on Wednesday night. Wednesday is going to be prayer meeting. It's going to be prayer meeting. We're going to turn it into intercessory prayer. Listen, folks, we've got to pray to break this thing. It's gotten off quiet. we got a prayer. Listen, how many of you have children at home that are under covenant because you're under covenant with God and you have household salvation, but they're not living for the Lord right now? How many got daughter-in-laws, sister-in-laws, brother-in-laws, friends, people in your house that you love that have not come to Christ yet? Come on now. And you know what we need, don't you? We need the Holy Spirit to come with holy conviction back in the house of God one more time. Holy conviction, not condemnation. There's a, my wife's going to teach on this sometimes, the difference between condemnation and conviction. But I'm talking about conviction of the Holy Spirit to convict them of their sin and draw them to the cross of Calvary. And it's going to take prayer to water that seed. Earnest, intense prayer. He said, if you'll fear me and come unto me, he said, if you'll humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and if you'll, you'll come to my house and you'll humble yourselves and pray, I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. Now, I believe the Holy Scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. My people, which are called by my name. So I believe with all my heart I'm on the right track about prayer. I really do. He, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, if you make this a house of prayer, I will come and I'll pour out my spirit. I said, okay, Lord. And this is what he told me specifically. And we're going to do this at the end of the service. He said, if you'll bless the pulpit, and if you'll bless, he used the phrase pew, and I know we don't have pews, we have chairs. But if you'll bless the pew, you'll bless the people. you bless the people. Bless the pulpit, bless the people. He said, I myself will come and I will bless the gathering. And so I'm standing on that. That was three weeks ago the Lord showed that to me. And I'm standing on that. I bless this pulpit. That everything that comes through this pulpit will be gospel. And listen, friend, if it's not gospel, I'll shut it down. If it's not gospel, I'm telling you, I, I will not tolerate any, any bit of false doctrine. I just won't. I can't do it. I, I'm too tired to mess around with false doctrine. I'm 24 and a half years old now, man. Bless the pulpit, bless the people, and I'll bless the gathering. I'm holding the Lord to that. I'm holding Him to it. And I'm thanking Him for it. He's going to bless our gathering. Our church will grow. Amen? <clears throat> you know, I talked this week to uh, probably oh, seven, eight, nine, ten people. And everybody's having dreams and visions and revelations this week. I mean, everybody I talked to, God revealed something to me, boy. Uh, uh, brother, praise the Lord. <laughs> Willie? Willie? Hey, it's my brain, not yours, man. Mine's the ones in trouble. Willie, you just shared with me. Dear, I had a dream. She, she had a revelation and dream. I talked to two other ministers, had revelation and dreams. Bree had a revelation this week. The Lord showed her something about prayer. I think it was about prayer. God showed her something about prayer. See, I hear things, sis. I, I hear things. I'm not always the last one to hear it. Amen. It was, good. it was a good thing. It was powerful. Powerful. And I'm saying, Lord, you're up to something. <clears throat> and as I was saying a while ago, as I gave this to the, the church on Wednesday night, I gave it to the church on Wednesday night, <clears throat> and I called the people up forward, Brother Don and... Um, um, Aunt, not Aunt Melissa, but I mean, you, I, my mind today, I'm telling you what's playing tricks on me. Melissa, which is Don's wife, you know, our assistant. And uh, Don was here. I called the people up, and it was just, like I say, it was just a few of us. And I called them up, up, up here to the front. 
and we was just going to pray. The Lord instructed me to, to tell the people, let's pray. We're going to pray. We're going to bless the pulpit. We're going to bless the people. And we're going to let the Lord bless the gathering. And we've got to start somewhere, folks. You know what I'm saying? I mean, all oh, that pulpit needs blessed. And the pew needs blessed. The people need blessed. And he started saying, now this is how I want you to start speaking about the pulpit. Because I had gone home before and I said, Lord, you know what? I appreciate nobody. The dog didn't even wag his tail at that sermon. And here I'm telling God this. And then I get a phone call or an email or something on uh, Freedom's page or something and said, my God, that sermon changed my life. And I go back in the back room and repent. And the Lord says, you're going to have to change your mouth about what you say about what I say. Don't look at me like you're some kind of angelic beings out there and stuff like that, man. Don't be, you know. And I said, oh, Lord, you've got to teach me about this blessing thing. And that's when he said, he said, you bless that pulpit. And when I speak the word of God through you, you know that I'm blessing that pulpit and people are hearing. And he said, you bless the people and I'll give them ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. And that's exactly what the Lord showed me. And I'm not going to back off of it. Wednesday night, I called him up here, and I said, okay, let's join hands. Now, Brittany was here, and, uh, Britt and David's wife was here, uh, my daughter was here, uh, the Ciferos were here, and we had other folks in the back room back there, we had the youth class back there and such, but there was nine people in here. Mark Sr. was here, he's always here, he's a permanent fixture, he's been here forever. He walks around here when nobody else is here, Amen. I love that boy. <clears throat> well, we called him up, and I, and I looked at Brother Schiffer, and I said, my God, how many people we have up here? He said, we have nine. I said, well, what's nine mean in, in Bible numero numerology? He said, nine means birthing. <laughs> and my spirit, I want to tell you something, my spirit leaped in me. I know a little bit about numbers in the Bible. I know, I know they're significant, you know, seven being number of completion and God's holy number and such. And, and um, you know, um, number six being the number of man and all those things. I've studied on it, but <clears throat> I asked Don that, and I said, my God, that's nine, number of birthing. It was, I believe it was not an accident that there were nine people here on Wednesday night to seal the revelation that God gave to me to share with the congregation. I, I don't believe it was an accident. Spirit of God touched everybody in that circle. And everybody in that circle could sense the presence of God, yet God was opening something up. They had not heard, uh, those Wednesday night did, they had heard this vision that I'd given. Uh, it's not because of me. It has nothing to do with me. Uh, it's just a simple fact. God is up to something. He's up to something. Now, I want to share a verse of Scripture with you, and then I'm going to read this vision. I know you've been wanting to hear this, but... I've got to read this verse of Scripture. I'm just trying to follow the Spirit of God up here. Is that okay? You just give me a few more minutes. <clears throat> in uh, Timothy, in Timothy, let I me mean, know you got a book of Timothy in your Bible. You have two Timothys in your Bible, but it's the same Timothy. First Timothy and Second Timothy. I'm going to take you to, um, I believe it's uh, First Timothy, because I'm just um, just listening to this. In fact, it's Second Timothy chapter one. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter one. I want to talk to you just a minute, then I'm going to read this to you. This vision. God has instructed me, and He said, You teach my people how to bless. You teach my people how to bless. I'm looking at everybody today, and you're all blessed, and I understand that. You're blessed. You really are. You love Jesus. You're blessed. <clears throat> but He spoke to me, and He said, You teach my people how to walk in their blessing, how to live out their blessing. 
My wife and I both, is, we, we're blessed. I've, I've put my hand to stuff and my mouth to stuff and I've blessed it and I've watched God do powerful stuff, powerful things. We've established three churches. We've pastored six churches in all throughout the country and established three churches. Everything God has instructed us to do was blessed. It was blessed powerfully. We established a church over on Mesker Park Drive that has over 200 in attendance now. And I'm thankful for that. We appointed the pastor to go in there to pastor the church when the Lord said it's time to move forward and we serve as an apostle. Many people don't understand that. They don't understand that, that uh, there's apostles, prophets, pastors, uh, you know, there's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. There's a five-fold ministry. And I want you to know this preacher works in all five-fold of those offices, every one of them. Some of them more strongly than others. But I want to read this to you about ancestry. Your ancestry. Say, my ancestry. Or my forefathers. It's powerful because somewhere along the line, everybody in this room has had a forefather, an ancestor, a forefather. They may be still alive, but they also may be... be, be uh, Passed on into the heavens, or they're passed on by now. But they've passed on something in you. They have, by the grace of God and the power of God, deposited something in you. Something of good, or it could have been something bad. But uh, let's just say, for the sake of the Word of God, that it was something good. It was a blessing from the Lord. <clears throat> it was something from the Lord. And you say, preacher, is this scriptural? That the way I am today and what the way I'm, I'm being shaped today has anything to do with my forefathers. Oh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. And the, the problem is and the fact is that many people have been spoken, things have been spoken into their life and it's not been in the positive vein. It's not even in the God vein and the enemy has put it on people so heavy that they've chose the negative vein and they're walking in the realm of a curse. But those of us that have been born again and those of us that have been in tune with God and those of us that have submitted to the Lord, we're walking and we choose to walk in the blessing and not the curse. Amen? We choose to put a guard on our tongue. We choose... Life instead of death. We choose goodness and mercy instead of bad things. We choose those things. We choose them. I choose them. I choose to say that my children and my children's children are blessed. I don't care what they're doing. They're blessed by God. I choose to talk about my grandbabies in a healthy way that they're going to do great things and they are doing great things and they will do great things and they will be the head and not the tail. They will achieve great things for God. No matter how hard the pressure is, your family is blessed. Blessed by God. I want you to see this. 2 Timothy... Chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. This is Paul speaking. He said, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first. Somebody say first which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and in thy mother, Eunice. And Paul said this to Timothy. He said, and I am persuaded that faith is in you. This is ancestry. This is genealogy. You know, there's some people that are, that, are, that are born with pretty genes. You know what I mean? There's pretty people. 
The rest of us need makeup. There are some people born pretty. I mean, the whole family's pretty. The males and the females, they're, they're handsome and pretty, all the whole deal. Some people are born with athletic genes. I tried playing basketball like Michael Jordan. That's the only one I can remember. I could hit that that I could hit the backboard. That's what I could do. Some people are born with um, intelligence, very intelligent, brilliant people, Einsteins, you know, people like that. And if that's the case, which it is the case because genes are passed down, then it is a God thing to be born blessed. Born blessed. Paul said to Timothy, and Paul being Timothy's mentor, you know what a mentor is? Let me explain to you what a mentor is. I consider myself a mentor if God will allow me to be. I consider myself a mentor. A mentor is not to shape a person in their image a mentor is to shape a person based on a, a God deposit that's been placed on the person being mentored. In other words, to pull out of the person what God has deposited. I don't want a bunch of Ron Kissels running out around here. We'd be in trouble. You are designed to be blessed by God just exactly the way God made you. You don't have to be a copy. A mentor is not a copier, copy machine. A mentor, listen, do you have people that say God bless you to you? They say God bless you. You know, it's just a metaphor in many cases. It's just a, a wording of, of words in many cases. We say, well, God bless you. I had a man one time, he said, God bless, he, he shook my hand, he said, God bless you, and he wasn't even looking at me. I said, my God, you're not blessing me. You're looking at somebody else and talking to somebody else, and you're saying, God bless, God bless you. You understand that when you speak something out of your mouth, you are sending forth something into the atmosphere, whether it's good or bad. When you say, you know what it means to say God bless you? It means that you are speaking upon something, a person, a place, and I'm pointing to them, a person, a place, or a thing. You're speaking something upon a person, place, or thing that you want to see accomplished and come to pass. So when you say God bless you, you're sending forth you will prosper. You will be blessed. You will walk in the anointing. You will come to know Christ early. You will have gifts and you will have benefits. You are sending forth something of a God nature in the inside of your words are making their way into the atmosphere and the very fabric of their spirit. You're sending forth. Now you could speak that upon yourself too. Some of you have been wondering why. And how come the anointing of God is upon me, but I have not seen the results of this anointing that's on my life? And listen, hold on, because you will see it. You will see it. Paul said, I see something in you, Timothy, that was upon your grandmommy, your grandma, your grandmammy. I see it. Listen. My wife was saying just the other day, she was saying, we've had mentors in our life and people in our life that have passed on and went to be with Jesus. And every time a mentor in our life passes on to go with Jesus, I, my heart goes, Ooh, give me another mentor, Lord. People that instructed us when we were young in the faith, they're now in heaven, and I can still hear their voice and things that they've spoken into our lives, nudging us on to keep living for Jesus. Listen, you say, preacher, this is Halloween. You believe in spooks? No, I believe in the work of the Holy Spirit and our ancestors that have gone on. The Bible says their prayers are still bottled up and God has cracked the bottle, glory to God. And he's pouring out his spirit on some of the prayers that your grandmammy and your mama has prayed. Yeah. 
Paul said this faith, unfeigned faith, is laying at your door. It was on your grandmammy. It was on your mother Eunice. And Paul said, I see it on you. Don't tell me that genes are not passed down from generation to generation. But let me tell you something about Timothy. There's one thing that I found out about God and how He deals with people, how He deals with me. Every time God's getting ready to crack something open for His glory, for His people, all hell breaks forth. It never fails. Timothy suffered from severe depression. Did you know that? A man of God in the Bible. You find it in his writings, or Paul to his writings to Timothy. He said, God's not given you the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. The spirit of fear was extreme depression. Timothy couldn't get out what his heart was trying to say. How many people have the fear of man upon them right now and they got the fear of man upon them and they can't speak when it's time to speak. They've got something on the depths of their heart and the depths of their being and they can't get it out and they can't speak it because of the fear of man. You exchange the fear of man because the Bible says the fear of man is a snare with the fear of God. And he'll open your mouth wide and you can speak. Some people cower down. They can't even speak up to another person and begin to deal with maybe a problem or a situation. They'd rather just run from it. Listen, we can't be like that, man. We've got to look at the situation for what it is and in the name of Jesus, bind the devil and take authority in the name of Jesus and stand up in the presence of God and be the man and the woman of God that God has called you to be. You're not to cower down under anything. Stand up and be accounted for for the glory of God. Stand up. Be accounted for. Paul said to Timothy, he said, God's not given you the spirit of fear, but of love, power, authority, and a sound mind. Don't you be going to God saying, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. When you go to God, you say, you're my heavenly Father and I'm a child of the Most High God. I'm the righteousness of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I know you know what to do. Do it. Glory to God. I believe you to do it. Sometimes we don't know what he's going to do, but you've got to go to God believing. You can't be whimpering around and saying, to God, it's over and I'm washed up, my time's done, and all that stuff. You can't be talking to God like that. Because he, he, he hears you, but it's like, oh my God. That's my daughter down there talking like that stuff. When I've got all this, I've got all this taken care of. What in the world are you doing, daughter? Paul told Timothy, he said, your grandmammy believed God. I remember my great grandmother. <laughs> this bears witness with me because I remember my great grandmother. She'd come over uh, and uh, bring us presents for Christmas. And you got to understand, we grew up poor. Apples and oranges for Christmas was like, woohoo! Well, let's have them. They bring you underclothes. I said, You put them on. I want them oranges, man. I'm serious now. You got to understand. And she come over and she said, let me give you some sugar first, baby. She, all half her teeth were gone. <laughs> she had a little sugar on my cheek. Oh, yeah, good boy. Slobber running down my jaw. That's why I'm anointed today. You know that, don't you? <laughs> then my Aunt Sally... I'll give you some sugar, honey. Slobber running down both jaws. That's 
where I got my anointing, man. <laughs> you know, there's something, something about those, those old timers, but they spoke things into our lives. I listened to them. I don't care what their personality was about. I don't care if they went home and smoked cigarettes. I could, that's not my business. I'm not their judge. Do you understand what I'm saying? My grandmammy and my Aunt Sally and my great-grandmother, which I knew very little, Grandma Grady, very little. I knew her very little. But I remember at her casket at five years old, my, my sister Darlene was there. We was there. I remember at the casket of my great-grandmother feeling the power of God. And I asked Mom, what is that I feel? And she said, oh, your, your great-grandmother was a powerful woman of God. She was a prayer warrior. And I could feel like a hug from God right there at the casket. Let me tell you something. Ancestral blessings are powerful. They're powerful. Paul said that faith's on you. He said that faith, it's your grandmammy and your mama had that faith Paul said, I see it on you. There's many things that a pastor sees on people, and in some cases he never sees them come to pass because people don't have the capacity to line up with supervision and instruction. It's important who gets around you, who talks to you, and who feeds into the line of command that God's put in your life. If you get around doubting and fearful and unbelieving and lackadaisical and horizontal people, you get around people that quote, I am a Christian but live like the devil, listen, it's going to affect your life. We've got to be a holy people. And you know what Paul said? Next verse, let's look at it. You want to? You want to? Let's look at the next verse. <clears throat> Paul said, uh, you've got faith that I see that's engendered here, and I see it on you, son. Mentors try to pull things out of people. Paul was Timothy's mentor. He tried to pull this out of him. But look what he said in verse 6. I love this. He said, I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. You stir it up. Listen, God's in the stirring business. He is stirring some things up in the church. He is stirring some things up in your life and in my life. He's stirring you up. You may be saying, oh God, what's happening in my life? What's going on in my life? I don't even know how to pray anymore. I don't know how to talk to you anymore. My God, what's going on in my family? My kids are just running here and there, and they're doing all this stuff. And God is stirring you up to believe Him. We've tried to solve it with all kinds of psychological ways, and I believe in psychology, because if we didn't have psychology, we wouldn't have a brain. Psychology is okay. You need your brain fixed sometimes. Amen? Let's go back here and laugh. You need your brain fixed sometimes. I need my brain fixed sometimes. I needed to fix a while ago. I couldn't even remember Willie's name. I need my brain worked on sometime. I need some psychology work. And it's all right. But you've got to understand when it comes to the spiritual things of God and when it comes to the deep things of God and when it comes to the hand of God moving in on a conditioned situation or circumstance or something that you need to happen, it's going to take an act of God and man can't do it. It's going to take God intervening. It's going to take the power of God intervening. Paul said, stir it up, son. Stir it up. Get back in your prayer chamber, son. Get back on your face and get back into fasting and prayer. Some of you remember how it was when you first got saved. Your body shook under the power of God. Your eyes socket shook. God moved into your body. He moved into your life and you were on fire. You couldn't sit still. Every song you was going, oh my God, glory to God. Every time the preacher, my God, 
watch you were moving. Now you can't wait to get out of church. You know you got to go because everybody will say you backslid. So you don't want to be called a backslider. So you come in and go through the motions. Don't lie to me. Everybody in this room went through the motions at one time or another. You had faith, but you didn't know where it was. <laughs> you believed God, my God, you believed Him, but you're trying to say, my God, what is that all about? <laughs> and you had to go back and remind yourself. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I've been purged by the hand of God. God has touched my life, given me revelation. My God is in my life. And you got to stir yourself up. Stir it up. You know what God said? He said, I'll bless the fruit of your body. And then he said, I'll bless the fruit of your field. He said, every time you go out hunting, I'll give you some game. That's why old Cleek back there, every time he goes hunting, he... He comes back with something. Look at this, mama. That's because God said it. You hear me? That's because God said it. He said, you walk in my ways. I'll bless you coming in and going out. I'll bless that. You'll be the head, not the tail. I'll bless everything that you do. Your, everything you do, prosper. Everything you do, I'll be in the midst of it. Everything. You read it in your Bible. I believe God said that. Paul told Timothy, he said, stir it up. How many of you got a fireplace at your house or capacity to put a fireplace at your house? Look at that. There's a few of us here. In our house the other day, uh, Marcos, I went home, and we've had a wood burner going already this year. I'd, I'd, if you had one, you'd be doing it. I guarantee you would. I walked in there, and I thought, my God, that fire's out, Bree. And there's just, just ashes, you know, just gray ashes all over the top of it. I could still feel a little heat off of it. And I got in there with the stove poker. My mama come at me with one of them one time. I won't tell you that story sometime. But I got in there with the stove poker. I began to stir it around. And there was three or four coals in there about that big. And my mind says, I just wonder if that fire will get lit up if, if I put some dry bark wood on it and put some dry wood on top of it, just little pieces and then a little bigger piece. I wonder if it'd get fired up. I kind of put them up in a little pile and I put a piece of wood on it, went in and took a shower. And I got out, man, of the shower and that fire was going. <laughs> Guess where I went? You hear me? There's coals of fire, embers of fire laying on the inside of you. Some of you right now, you've had dreams and visions and revelations and God has talked to you in days past. And I'm asking you today, can God take his stove poker? Can he take his poker and poke around on the inside of you and light you back up for the glory of God? Light you back up for the things of God that you'll be excited about coming to the house of God again. Can God stir you up? Do you have the capacity to be stirred? We watched that little movie last night with a couple of our grandbabies that the Columbine thing that happened in Columbine and that little girl that was in between whether she wanted to live for God or not live for God. And finally she made a full commitment to Jesus and she was one of the first ones that was killed at Columbine. She had a diary. And she had a little thing on her dresser that God had spoken to her when she was a child. This is true story, okay? It's not just a movie, it's a true story. It's what was written down in her diary before she was killed at a young, young age. The back of her dresser was written the words, I will do something great for God Almighty in the name of Jesus. And she put her palm print up there when she was just a baby. Let me tell you something. 
If God has his hand on you, and he does have his hand on you, he had his hand on your grandmammy, on your babies, and on your mama, and he's got his hand on your babies in the name of Jesus. Don't you think the devil's going to get them? He won't have them because the Lord's already got them in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to let any devil in hell have my babies. Paul said, the faith's on you, son, but it's up to you to stir it up. If you feel like your nest is being stirred this past week, maybe some of you this past year, you've been stirred. And your way of life and, and what you're used to is all upside down. Maybe you got a spouse that said they were something that's not really what they said they were. Maybe you got a family member that's given you hell. Some of my worst enemies have been family members. Their mouth spewing out. If you hear somebody spew something out about this preacher, you better shut them down because if you take part in what they're spewing out, you will take part in the thing that God will judge. Watch how you talk about one another. If there's something you don't like in another person, you keep your mouth shut. If you talk to anybody about it, you talk to God about it, and you better be, keep it between Him and, and, and Him. Don't you be spread, spreading that hogwash someplace else in somebody else's ears. Listen, God already told me, He said, reckoning day has come. You read it in Deuteronomy, He said, I will, I will curse the third and the fourth generation that hate me and speak evil of my people in my ways. He said, but I will bless the righteous that uphold my principles. Folks, listen, I encourage you to uphold the principles of God. Don't get off in a gossip session. You get a mama on the phone that starts saying stuff about other people in the church, you better shut them down. Hear me? I didn't want to end this service like this, but I'm a preacher of the gospel because I've, I've got to go home and sleep at night. You're in a blessed church, by the way. You hear me? I'm going to give this altar call. I was going to say God's tired of some stuff, but I'll tell you what, I don't know how God can get tired because He'd rather have mercy than sacrifice. But I believe God's putting some conditions on his church now. I'm going to read this, this to you. And I want to ask you to join with me. There's also, if you'll stand with me please. <clears throat> There's also a prayer of faith about sin that's on the back in the back pulpit. If you want to pick up a copy of that, my wife copied this. And you want to pick that up. It's uh, really encouraging how to deal with sin, how to deal with something that keeps coming up in our lives. <clears throat> That's one of the first things that we have to deal with. Uh, when we're dealing with opposition, we have to check ourselves to be sure there's no sin in our life. Amen? Uh, what we've been doing around here on Wednesdays and we'll continue to do, we're just keeping a heart of prayer. Um, is we're, we're, we're just seeking the face of God. We're just humbling ourselves before the Lord. I don't know what else to say. I've been doing this 40 years, folks. Nearly 40 years. And uh, I'm saying, God, we need you to intervene. That's what I'm saying. We need God to intervene. I want to see every one of your sons and your daughters come to Christ. <clears throat> I want to see a revival in this church. We've been here 11 years and I'm saying, God, I want to see our church grow and I want to see revival. 
I want to see a move of the Spirit of God. I'm asking for you to help me. I'm going to read this to you, and I call it the vision. <clears throat> We're not any music yet, please. Thank you, sweetheart. I call it the vision, the God line. This is what the Holy Spirit downloaded inside of me. He said, <clears throat> he said, the time has come. He said, the time is now. The set time is now. The doorknob has been turned with the Father's hand still on the knob. I seen His hand, folks, when I seen that in my spirit. I can't explain it to you. It's transparent. I just seen His hand. It was like flesh, but it was transparent, pure as crystal. It was so beautiful. It's like God's hand, just right on the knob right there on the doorknob. He said His hand will only be on the knob for a season. He said, if we pray and submit to his plan and watch the door, I, the Lord, says, I will open the door wide. I will come and heal my people. I will not slightly come, but completely. But I say, not all will partake of my blessing, but only the remnant church will see this. Many will watch from a distance and not know, but you will know my whereabouts. In the day appointed after prayer, the deposit will be uh, go forth into my inventory, and the appointed season I will come and fully bring about my promise to my people. I will have one people with one heart, fed from my line of command. Watch what I say, and do not sleep from coming to visit my remnant church. That's what the Holy Spirit given me. He said, I'm coming. He said, his hand is on the knob. The, hand, the, the knob is turning. It is turning while it's in his hand. And then I saw the door. Of course, we know the Lord's the door. I'm not going to explain it all to you. Just, It's back there in the back. If you want to pick one of these up, please do. And I ask you to catch this vision here. Because I really believe if we hold on to what it is the Lord is showing us, as a church, we're going to reap the benefits of what only God can do. I believe that with all of my heart. <clears throat> Folks, I'm to the place, and I know my wife is as well, we're both to the place. <clears throat> we realize we cannot do this. The next phase of what God wants done has to be done by God. It has to be a God moment and a God move. And he said if we'll position ourselves, we'll put ourselves in a position, and submit, position, submit. He said, I will come and visit my people and I will heal them, not slightly, but completely. And I'm standing on that, folks. I am. I'm standing on it with all of my heart. You're going to hear me say it over and over again. We need him to come and heal us.